So the WSA provides access control policies, and for most of us, of all the WSA features, this is one of kind of our go-to things. Uh, the WSA is going to take a look at the web transactions that come in and go out and give us a much more granular level of control than we've had with some of the other products. Remember, this is a, a basically a, a very purpose-built device. Um, the ASA, Firepower, those are fantastic, but remember what their requirements are. It has to do everything. It's terminating VPNs, it's routed mode, it's transparent mode, it's got a... Uh, you know, perform application inspection of SIP, HTTP, FTP. Uh, it's got to look at SQL traffic. It's got to do dynamic fix-ups for trivial file transfer protocol. Uh, you know, you think about it, and it's like this ASA has got to do so many different things, it's starting to look like a, a multi-purpose tool, almost like a Swiss Army knife or something. We look at the WSA and we go, oh, this is a purpose-built tool. This does one tool, one thing, one application, which is HTTP, really, really well. It gives us additional granular control. Does it mean we don't use the ASA for HTTP filtering? Potentially. <laughs> you could, you could do some filtering, but what you're going to have there is going to be a subset of what's available on the WSA. Just like we can do some light protection on the ASA, on Firepower, for our Meryl servers, but the best thing that we can put in front of our mail server is an ESA. Why? Because it's a purpose-built appliance just for looking at email content. So the WSA is going to look at the way users interact with the internet. We've got identification profiles, which are basically our if condition, one of them at least. We're saying, hey, WSA, when you see these users, I'm like, who are these users? I go, those are my sales folks. And they go, okay, well, if sales folks are going to you know, certain websites during certain times of the day, that's appropriate. If the engineers are doing it, maybe that's inappropriate. How about our HR people? Well, they'll get even different rules. So we can look at different groups of users, and then we can give them exceptions to what the company would have as a general wide, you know, kind of like a, a company-wide policy. So you create a policy that's general for everybody. Like maybe nobody should be um, buying stocks during the day. We go, we're, you, know, you know what, no online trading during the day, we're gonna block it for everyone. And then maybe you have an exception. Maybe the HR folks come to you and they say, well, there's some financial websites that we have to work with because it deals with enrollment into the 401k program or the ability to buy stocks or options within the company. So that's where we'd go in and we'd say, okay, for the identification profile of HR or of accounting, they can go to these particular websites. The access policies are also going to match classified web transactions. So you go, who are you talking to? And they go, what type of site is it? And you go, oh, this is a site about chemical warfare. Maybe that's normal for your business. Maybe that's something that's a little bit weird. And you go, okay, well, that category we want to kind of leave alone. Cisco's got over 80 categories, and you've got the ability to create custom categories. So just realize whatever may be appropriate or inappropriate, whatever might cause problems in the organization, uh, versus not cause problems, we can filter those types of things. Really, really handy. So the access policy defines how the WSA evaluates web transactions. The policy is built up of two parts, the membership criteria and the control settings. Again, I call that membership criteria kind of like an if condition. We come over here and we go, who does it apply to? If you're a member of all, this is gonna apply to you. What protocols are user agents? Um, what's going on with the URL filtering? What's going on with their applications, objects, and anti-malware and reputation filtering? Notice that we can build different policies for each of those columns, and then those policies apply to the users that we identify in the if condition of our membership criteria. So a lot of times we define who that group is, and then we say these are the rules that apply to the group. So the policy group membership can be defined by various options an identification profile, users, protocols, proxy ports, subnets, time range. Maybe, you can, maybe you're not allowed to buy, buy and trade stocks from the hours of 9 to 5. The market's open. However, if you're participating in foreign markets, if you're still here after 5 p.m., maybe you're avoiding traffic, maybe you're working late, maybe I don't really care what you do after hours. It's just within the time range that I want certain rules to take effect. Uh, again, we many times tie into this based on those URL categories that are going to be automatically populated for you. You can also make restrictions based on user agents. 
This can be handy if you've got kiosks or IoT devices throughout the organization. We can say, well, if it's this type of user agent, I know it's the kiosk, and I only want these categories being hit. Just for example. So the identification profiles, again, this is a huge part of it. This is really our, our condition for where we're defining who do the rules apply to. Could be done based on subnet, protocol, proxy ports, URL category, and user agents. The identification profiles define if user authentication is required. Do we have to have user auth? If so, we can even have better granular data. Um, if a web transaction is matched against one identification profile, what's gonna happen is we go, just as we've seen before, in a top-down manner. And if we don't match the first list, we try the second. Don't match the second, we hit the third. Don't match the third, eventually we hit a default list at the bottom that's a catch-all, and then we wind up playing by those rules. The identification profiles uh, you see here below, and what we have is a name, kiosk workstation. Who's in the kiosk workstation? We're defining it by IP address. We've got a dedicated VLAN here, dedicated subnet range just for the kiosks in the lobby. The protocols that we're gonna be interested in are both HTTP and HTTPS, and then as we go through here, um, we're gonna be able to leverage that identification profile when we create rules. The rules that we define will only apply to the kiosk workstation. If you're not a kiosk workstation, we keep going down the list and we go, okay, HR. And you're like, well, wait a minute, my IP address starts with 10.5. I'm not HR. How about developers? You go, I'm not developers, I'm 10.5, which means you'd hit this global identification profile. This just applies to everybody else. Uh, again, here we've got how people need to be authenticated. What realm are they gonna use? Again, the realm just refers to when we perform authentication, where does a user account really live? Typically it's off an AD, typically it's off an LDAP, but a lot of times we maybe connect there through ICE. So this just really ties into where are we gonna look for those credentials. As far as enforcing the limits and quotas, protection against increased usage of web traffic can be achieved through various implementations, right? Uh, two that we're discussing here are time range. So we're allowing access during and outside of defined hours. So if there's things that are maybe not that bad, but you just have problems where lots of users are wasting time during the day, doing whatever, maybe it's social networking. You, go, you can hang out on Facebook, you can hang out uh, on, and watch YouTube videos, but you gotta get here before 9 a.m. or you're hanging out after 5 p.m. to do so. So if you wanna come in early or stay late to beat traffic, you can browse the web. However, you know, during the day, maybe those things are not, not available. Or alternatively, if you see people browsing YouTube, and they go, well, we need YouTube for work. I go, okay, that's fine, but we're gonna limit the bandwidth. So does YouTube work well for everybody? Not really, it's slow. But if you let things buffer, if you let them queue up, you can basically get your do job done and watch the video. Um, again, just different approaches that we can take. Quotas can also be based on time or volume. So we can look at specific volumes of data. And I mentioned HTTP and HTTPS before, but for those of you still using uh, file transfer protocol, um, we can also implement limits on FTP traffic through the WSA. When we talk about the access policy, again, this is what it is that you're allowed to do. That policy is gonna get hooked to the identification profile. So again, traffic comes in and we go, who is the request coming from? We go, ah, it's the IT department. Um, and then based on it being the IT department, there's gonna be specific rules talking about what, what it is that they're allowed to do. Um, again, we try to classify that top-down order. If we can't make a better classification, they're just gonna hit a default rule. So a lot of times if you're configuring it, configure everything that's appropriate in the default rule, assuming you'll miss something, right? There's a new VLAN, there is um, an additional subnet, there was an IP address pool for remote access VPN users I didn't think about, what happens by default? And sometimes you might wanna make that very restrictive. People will come talk to you sooner, which you may not <laughs> necessarily desire, but they're gonna come and say, hey, I was trying to get to this website, your firewall's giving me issues, you know, help me get there, make an exception. So that's a scenario where we would be blocking by default, throwing everything away that we can, and then we'll come in and we'll make, you know, general exceptions or pinholes for users as needed. 
So again, once we identify who somebody is, we'll check the access policy. It's like, who, you are, who are you? And then once we figure, figure out who you are, we can define what it is that you're allowed to do. Um, now beyond just visiting websites, we can block specific types of files. So I can just say, you know what, we've had too many issues. If a salesperson tries to download an executable, I want to throw it away. And you go, come on, there's good reasons that that might happen. And I go, yep, and there's some bad reasons, and they've bit me too many times, so I'm going to take that capability away. Um, just realize that you have access to some file types as well as uh, URL categories.